Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime episode here on my YouTube channel. Before we get started, I want to thank the two sponsors that we have for today's video, which are Green Chef and BetterHelp. If you have never heard of Green Chef, Green Chef is a USDA certified organic company that makes eating well easy and affordable. Green Chef has meal plans that include paleo, plant-based, keto, and balanced living. Green Chef lets you choose from a wide variety of easy to follow lifestyles with select organic ingredients. Their ingredients come pre-measured, perfectly proportioned, and mostly prepped with everything being hand-picked and delivered straight to your door. I cannot stress enough how much time Green Chef has saved me and how convenient it's been. I know for me personally, after a long work day, I tend to just grab whatever I can, whatever's the easiest, whatever's the quickest, not really taking into account the effect that it's going to have on my body afterwards and how I'm going to feel afterwards. And that's why I love Green Chef is because everything I need is already Already right in front of me. All I have to do is cook it and I won't feel some guilt about eating something unhealthy afterwards. And I also want to mention that Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh, which is a company I've talked to you about in the past as well. And I personally love switching off between Green Chef and HelloFresh, just depending on how I'm feeling. So if you guys want to check out Green Chef, you can use the code KILLER80 to get $80 off your first month using Green Chef as well as free shipping. You can go to greenchef.com slash killer80 to redeem and to get more details. Details. Again, that is just greenchef.com slash killer80 for $80 off your first month plus free shipping on your first box. So thank you, Green Chef, for sponsoring this video. And our second sponsor we have today is BetterHelp. I've talked to you guys about BetterHelp in the past, and if you are unfamiliar with BetterHelp, BetterHelp is an online counseling service. You guys know I'm a huge advocate for getting help when you need it and not being embarrassed or ashamed. And what I love about BetterHelp is it allows you to get the help that you need in the comfort of your own home. Once you sign up with BetterHelp, you will be paired with an online counselor and if you want to change that counselor for any reason at any time you can do so for no additional charge but BetterHelp has counselors that are specialized in LGBTQ plus matters, depression, anxiety, family problems, grief, relationships, sleeping issues, PTSD, and more. With BetterHelp you can schedule secure phone and or video sessions with your counselor and again it is super convenient because you can just do it in the comfort of your own home. BetterHelp is available worldwide and financial aid is available to those who qualify and if you guys want to try out BetterHelp, you can get 10% off your first month using my code instinct all you have to do is go to betterhelp.com slash instinct again that is just betterhelp.com slash instinct you fill out a simple questionnaire you'll be matched with the counselor and you will be good to go so thank you BetterHelp, so much for sponsoring this video and now with that all aside let's move on into today's case today we are diving into one of the craziest cases that i have ever covered this is a solved case and as you can tell by the title of it. Today we are talking about the brutal murder of Iana Kassian. Let's jump right on into it. So to understand what happened to Iana, we have to backtrack a little bit and talk about a man named Blake Libel. So this is Blake Libel. Blake was born on May 8th, 1981 in Toronto, Canada. He was born to his parents, Lorne and Eleanor, and his father, Lorne, was a very prominent real estate agent and was also a Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame inductee. Lauren's father, so that would be Blake's paternal grandfather, sailed in the 1968 Summer Olympics and then went on to develop homes in the Toronto area. So Lauren followed in his father's footsteps in that regard with the real estate career. And then as far as Eleanor, Blake's mother goes, she came from a very wealthy background as well. Her father was a very, very successful businessman. So all in all, Blake's parents both came from very wealthy families and Blake's parents would go on to have him as well as his brother Cody who was older than Blake by one year. Now Lauren and Eleanor ended up getting a divorce and when this happened the boys ended up splitting up so Cody went and stayed with his father while Blake went and stayed with his mother and when this happened this really created a very estranged relationship between Blake and his father. It definitely caused for there to be a wedge in their relationship and when Eleanor ended up passing away unfortunately this basically left Blake with no family because him and his father never had a relationship after his parents ended up getting a divorce. So Blake definitely felt alone in that aspect. Blake was described as being born into the lap of luxury. Him and Cody, to put it bluntly, were just trust fund babies. That's what they were. When Eleanor ended up passing away, Blake ended up getting half of Eleanor's $12 million estate. That's about $6 million that he got. Blake was described as a friendly person and he was appreciated by those around him. So Blake 
ended up moving from Toronto, Canada to Hollywood, California in 2004 in hopes of beginning his career. Now, because of his background, because he came from a bunch of money, it was a lot easier for him to navigate living in Hollywood with the expenses, but also in getting a job. He ended up working for Spaceballs, the animated TV show, and I'm not exactly sure what role or position he had in that. I don't know if it was more behind the scenes or more in the forefront of things, but he did work on Spaceballs, and he also directed a very low-budget film called Bald. Now, when Blake first moved to Hollywood, he ended up getting married. He met a woman named Amanda Braun, and the two of them got married, and they were married from 2004 to 2015. And during the time of their marriage, they ended up having a son together, and then also during the time of their marriage in 2010, Blake ended up writing a graphic novel. Now, this graphic novel is called Syndrome, and he wasn't the only author involved in this novel. It was him, Daniel Quantz, RJ Ryan, and David Marquez. The book is still available for those who want to read it. I personally have not read it and do not want to read it, and you might see why as we continue, but if you are interested, it is out there and you can read it. Now, when Syndrome was published, Blake was very, very hopeful about it. He had very big dreams for Syndrome. He thought it could be going on to become a TV show even. He had really big expectations for Syndrome, and I'm gonna look over here so I can read the actual description of the book. So it says, quote, when a rogue neuropathologist makes a startling breakthrough, literally isolating the root of all evil in the recesses of the human brain, he'll stop at nothing to advance his theory. With the help of a naive Hollywood actress, a tormented motion picture director, and a condemned serial killer, Dr. Wolf Brunswick launches a bold experiment in the Nevada desert, the outcome of which could transform humanity forever. The Truman Show meets Seven in Syndrome, an inventive original graphic novel hardcover that serves as one of the first titles to be featured under Arkea's new black label line, published in association with Fantasy Prone. So that was Syndrome. It was published in 2010, and then we moved five years past that to 2015. And like I said, 2015 is the year that Blake ended up filing for divorce against his first wife, Amanda. Now, when Blake filed for divorce, Amanda was actually right about to give birth to their second child. So obviously, as you could imagine, for Amanda specifically, this was a very, very stressful time for her. However, Blake seemed to be handling things very differently. Not long at all after Blake served Amanda with divorce papers, did Blake meet a woman named Iana Kassian. Iana was born on January 27th, 1986 to her mother, Olga, and she was actually born in the Ukraine and lived there for the majority of her life. And while she was in the Ukraine, she actually studied law and became a prosecutor at the Ukrainian tax service. And it wasn't until 2014 that she ended up moving to the United States. She moved to Los Angeles, California, and she did so because she wanted to have a better life for herself. She wanted better opportunities. As you can tell, she's absolutely stunning. So she was thinking about becoming a model and pursuing that career. So when she met Blake, she thought that she hit the jackpot because Blake was someone at the time who really showed her that he could take care of her. He was a successful, wealthy man who proved that he could provide for her. So Iana was thrilled. She thought that she had met her dream guy when she ended up meeting Blake. So the two of them met in 2015, the same year that Blake had divorced from his first wife, Amanda, and only one year after Iana had moved to the United States at all. And so the two of them got together and they really hit it off, so much so that Blake ended up proposing to Iana in the same year, in 2015. And the surprises did not stop there because just a couple months after that, Iana found out that she was pregnant with her and Blake's first child together. Obviously, it was Blake's third child. However, this was Iana's first child and she was absolutely thrilled. She couldn't have been any more excited to become a mother. Her mom, Olga, remembers her calling her, telling her that she was pregnant and just remembering how excited Iana was about this new journey she was about to embark on. She had always wanted to become a mother. And when she found out that she was having a girl and that they were gonna have a daughter, it just brought things to a whole other level for Iana. And their daughter ended up being born in early May, 2016. Now, everyone in the family was thrilled with this new addition. Everyone was so ecstatic. Iana was thrilled and 
And even though Blake did seem happy at this time, he seemed excited that his daughter was now in the world, there was a very different side of Blake that started being shown around this time and some secrets that Iana didn't know about him started to come to light. So this perfect dream fantasy world that she thought she had gotten herself into, she slowly started to realize that this could quickly become her worst nightmare. So at this time, Blake had several stressors in his life and the first one involved his brother, Cody. Cell phone records show that several days following his daughter's birth, Blake had been texting a friend saying that he was concerned for him and his family's safety after his brother, Cody, had been gambling very, very large amounts of money, large amounts meaning about a million dollars to professional poker players, and Blake was worried that he could have gotten himself involved with Russian mobsters and that the end results could be very violent. So basically, Cody had a gambling problem and was gambling all of his money away. So these texts showed that Blake was definitely very concerned for his safety and his family's safety, but probably mostly just his safety. But this was not the only stressor in Blake's life because his romantic love life was also very chaotic around this time. So because Iana and Blake had met literally right after Blake filed for divorce against his first wife, Amanda, when Iana's daughter was born, that divorce was still in the process of being finalized. And at that time, Iana and Blake were living in an apartment together that they shared in West Hollywood, California. But Blake decided that this was not enough for him. So because of that, he started dating another woman named Constance Buca Fury. So now Blake was dealing with his divorce, his fiance, the birth of his daughter, and dating another woman all at the same time, which is Constance. Now this secret affair of Blake's did not last long because in mid-May 2016, Constance actually accused Blake of sexual assault and Blake ended up getting arrested and Iana was actually the one who bailed Blake out of jail after he was arrested for this. So you could imagine the possible tension that this would bring between Blake and Iana at this time. It was literally just days after their daughter had been born. So now let's move to May 23rd, 2016. This was three weeks following the birth of their daughter and one week following Iana bailing Blake out of jail. Now, according to Olga, she said that she noticed around this time that Blake's behavior towards her daughter was very different in a concerning way. Her words were that Blake, quote, controlled her like a hawk and wanted her to do everything that he wanted, end quote. Blake had actually figured out a way to convince Iana that their three-week-old daughter needed to go and stay at Iana's mother's house. And by the way, at this time, Iana's mother, Olga, was staying in Los Angeles as well. But Blake convinced Iana that their three-week-old daughter needed to go stay at Olga's house because the two of them needed to work on their sexual relationship because Blake was very unhappy with the fact that Iana didn't want to sleep with him all the time and would reject his advances. Mind you, she had just had a C-section three weeks prior, but that was not good enough for Blake. Blake would do things like threaten to leave Iana if she wouldn't sleep with him and would even go as far as asking her if he could leave her for another woman. Now on May 23rd, 2016, Iana was out shopping for baby strollers with her mother Olga in Los Angeles and Olga said that is when Iana received several different text messages from Blake and without giving her mother any context, she just said that Blake was texting her and that she had to go see him and so she left. But neither Olga or Iana knew that this would be the last time the two of them would see each other. Now the following day on May 24th, Olga had tried multiple times to reach her daughter. However, she received no answer, no text back, no phone call, no anything. And Olga was very worried. She just knew in her gut that there was something very wrong. And so because of that, she tried to get the police involved, but the police weren't really buying this at first. They didn't really think anything was wrong. They thought Iana was with her husband. She just had a baby. She's probably sleeping. She's resting. She's busy. But Olga knew. Olga knew that there was something very off. So she actually went to Blake and Iana's apartment and stood across the street because she wasn't allowed to be let into the apartment. She stood across the street shouting at Blake and Iana to open the door. However, this never happened. Olga said that while she was shouting, she did see Blake walk up to the window of their apartment and he just ended up closing the window and walking away. So at this point, Olga just wanted the police to do a welfare check. She asked at the very least that they do 
is just go check and make sure that everything is okay. And so police agreed to do this. They went to Blake and Iana's apartment. They knocked on the door. However, no one answered. And I'm not sure what the qualifications are for a welfare check. If you actually have to see the person, it, what, what the deal is. However, what I do know is that Blake never opened the door and authorities actually just ended up leaving. And that was that. So it wasn't until May 26th, 2016, which was three days after anyone had heard from Iana, that authorities finally decided that they were going to make a move on this case and that they were going to break in to Blake and Iana's apartment. Now, when they did this, they initially went up to the front door of the apartment, knocked on it a couple times and received no answer, which is when they broke the door down themselves. Now, when they broke the door down, they were immediately met with a hallway door and you can see this a lot in many different apartments or homes you'll have a hallway door that you open that leads to a hallway but then will lead to one bedroom or the master or a bathroom there will be different things aligning this hallway once you open this door and that was the way that Blake and Iana's apartment was set up. So when authorities opened the front door, they were met with this hallway door. And when they tried to open the hallway door, they realized that the hallway door had actually been locked and barricaded. So what they ended up having to do was they actually had to unhinge the door themselves. And once they took the hallway door off of the hinges, they realized that there was blood leading into the master bedroom. Now at this point, authorities knew that Blake was in the master bedroom and they had been calling his name, trying to get him to answer and Blake having heard everything going on outside of his apartment started screaming back at the authorities telling them that he was not coming out he was staying in his room they needed to leave and that Iana was not at the house now after trying to negotiate for Blake to come out of the bedroom himself it was actually a friend of Blake's well his accountant actually ended up coming to the apartment himself and ended up being the one who was able to lure Blake out of his bedroom and and we'll talk more in detail about that once we get to the trial. Once Blake opened the master bedroom door, that is when authorities saw the tortured, lifeless body of Iana laying in the master bedroom bed. Now, according to Detective Martindale, who was there at the time on the scene, in regards to Blake's behavior, he said that Blake was acting very callous. And the detective also said that when authorities were saying that Iana was dead in the bed, Blake responded by saying, quote, well, I guess you'll have to find out who did it then. Now before we talk about the crime scene, I want to take a second and talk about the condition that Iana's body was found in. And we're about to get very graphic here, so I just want to give you a warning. So when Iana's body was found, her body was found with her scalp scraped completely off of her head down to the bone. Her right ear had been cut off. There were multiple bruises all over her face, mainly on the left side of her face, on her left jaw. There was a bite mark on her left cheek. Authorities did notice that Iana's body looked as if it had been cleaned before authorities arrived. And they also found a bloody razor and a knife next to Blake's side of the bed. Now, the worst part about all of this is that the medical examiner concluded that Iana was actually alive for approximately eight hours following her scalp being scraped off of her head. As far as the crime scene goes, authorities found Iana's blood everywhere through that apartment, and they also found Blake's DNA throughout all of the apartment as well, which is obvious considering the fact that he lived there, but the main important thing to note is that there was no other DNA found on the crime scene. There was blood found in the kitchen drain pipe, and there was also pieces of Iana's flesh through the master bedroom. It was behind the bed frame, on the floor, and and just scattered throughout the master bedroom as well. In the basement of the apartment complex, authorities discovered 11 trash bags containing bloody sheets and clothes, as well as clumps of Iana's hair. And they also found her ear in those trash bags as well that had been cut off. An autopsy report was released on September 20th, 2017, and it concluded that Iana's cause of death was blood loss, considering she was drained of her blood. There was barely any blood in her when her body was found, as well as head trauma. Now, this was a brutal murder. Iana was tortured for countless hours prior to her succumbing to her injuries. And remember, their daughter was staying with Iana's mother at the time because Blake had convinced Iana that they needed to work on their relationship, so their daughter needed to go stay with her mother. Now, of course, 
police arrested Blake on the scene right away, no questions asked, and a trial date was set for June 2018. Now, the prosecution took a very interesting approach, and they had a very interesting argument that I'm really intrigued to see what you guys have to say about. And their argument essentially was that Blake used his book, Syndrome, as a blueprint for his murder of Iana. Again, I've never read the book, so I'm unaware of how mirrored it actually is. However, that is what the prosecution said, that Blake wrote this book and then did the things written in this book to Iana. Again, just to give you a synopsis, Syndrome is about a scientist who experiments on a serial killer believing that he can cure all evil and basically butchers him in the process. The prosecution also revealed that during the time of Iana's death while she was dying, over the course of the hours that she was dying, Blake had actually ordered Postmates on multiple different occasions and instructed the driver to just leave the food outside of the door. That way he wouldn't be interrupted. Now I want to go back and talk about the accountant, Blake's friend, the accountant, that actually was the one that ended up getting him to open the master bedroom door. This was a man named Stephen Green. And according to Stephen Green, he got a phone call from Blake during the midst of this standoff between the authorities and Blake. And Stephen arrived at the apartment complex immediately. He immediately got there and surveillance footage shows him running through the apartment complex lobby, getting into the elevator and heading up to Blake's apartment. Now, when he got to Blake's apartment, he was talking talking to Blake through the door and Blake had asked Stephen to hand him an outfit of Blake's that was sitting on the couch. Now, of course, authorities wanted to look at this outfit before it was given to Blake. And when they did that, they found Blake's passport in the pockets of this outfit, as well as $4,000 worth in cash. As far as motivation goes, the prosecution argued that Blake was jealous over the fact that his newborn daughter was getting more attention from Iana than he was. They argued that because Iana had rejected him sexually on multiple different occasions. It really struck his ego and he was not happy about it. Personally, I think the better way to put it, the more blunt way to put it, is that Blake is a narcissist. He's a narcissistic person. He only cares about himself. And when he felt like his needs weren't being met, he felt like he needed to take control of the situation. And that's why it took so long. That's why this process of torturing Iana took so long. It's because he wanted to feel that power, knowing that he he could stop this at any moment, knowing that he could keep going at any moment. He had all that power the entire time, but instead he decided to make it as painful of a process as possible and torture her for approximately eight hours. Now, the defense's argument was that Blake's DNA wasn't the only one found on the crime scene, that there was an unknown male's DNA also found on the crime scene. This argument really didn't stand well. Nothing came from this argument. And after deliberation in June 2018, the same month that the trial started, Blake was found guilty of first-degree murder with supplemental charges of torture and mayhem. And he was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Now, when giving the sentence, Judge Mar Mark Whitman made a quote, and I'm going to say it. I'm going to look over here so I can get it correct. He said, quote, this case was unusual due to the, quote, savagery, the defendant's profound brutality and his inconceivable cruelty, end quote. In February 2019, a California judge ordered Blake to pay $42 million to Iana's family. And as far as Iana's daughter, she has been in the care of her maternal grandmother of Olga, Iana's mother. And here's the thing. I understand that they're going to be getting $42 million. However, Iana's daughter is always going to grow up never knowing her mother. She's never going to get the chance to personally know her mother. She'll hear stories. She'll hear how much she was loved by her mother. However, she was brutally taken from her daughter by her father. The 42 million is the very, 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 very least bare minimum that this family can have. When I read about it, I almost didn't feel like it was real. This is the stuff that you hear about that you don't think is real. It's the stuff that movies are based off of and it's the stuff that you see on TV. But with these types of cases, you typically don't see something as brutal and as torturous as this. Blake wanted Iana to suffer. He wanted 
torture. He wanted this to go on for as long as possible and he wanted to be in control up until the very end. Him saying at the end of it, guess you better find out who did it, that's him being narcissistic. That's him being manipulative. That's him still trying to have the one up on everyone, thinking that he's greater than thou and is untouchable. I'm really, really interested to hear what you guys have to say about this case, so definitely let me know in the comments below. And with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another True Crime episode here on my YouTube channel. If you're new here, hi, my name's Savannah. I make videos three days a week, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. You should subscribe and join the family. I love you guys so much, and I'll be back in a couple days with a brand new video. Bye, guys.